we could do it. My answer to your question is, should we? Because those big one-off events suck in huge amounts of time and energy into sort of this one, how much closer is, orgasmic moment that makes everyone feel better in the short term. And I personally believe that the most successful activism is a bit lower key, a bit less emotionally intense, and is more focused outward than within the Green Movement. But if people, if, if Manchester's environmental groups decided that this was the way forward, then it's certainly something Climate Emergency Manchester would support, Manchester Climate Emergency would publicise. But they, those events can also be very, very top down. And without good meeting design and good facilitation, they can go down the wrong. Um, yeah, I'd like to know which councillors are supportive of a climate emergency because then we target the individual councillors that aren't and find ways of, you know, <laughs> persuading them, you know, make them, let them know that there is a, a, a will, a public will. Um, I I'd also like to know if my which of my councillors are or aren't supportive. Let, let me just say that it's a couple. They have said this stuff on social media, so I suppose technically I'm okay to say it. They tend to be the younger councillors and the one, both younger in age, but also younger on the council. I think we can divide um, the 93 Labour councillors into three categories. Ones that are on board already, which is a small group. Ones who are going to be adamantly opposed no matter what, which is a relatively large group. And then there's stuff to work on in the middle of that. But even if they say no to this um, petition, that doesn't mean that you give up on, on them. I think with limited resources, you probably are best to work on the group in the middle. But you definitely should always work on your own councillors. Like I live in what's now called Wally Range, and it's actually Moss Side. And I have the executive member for the environment <laughs> as my councillor, which is fun. Um, and she alone, she doesn't reply to me very much. So I sent your letter and nothing. So Emma wrote this fantastic letter asking councillors and MPs and Andy Burnham to support the school strike. And you just get blank. But, it, but it's like with the summer thing. Let's think of our activism as a process, not as an event. And let's think of lobbying, which I, there are people in this room who are far better at lobbying than me. Um, let's think of it as a process rather than an event. Does that answer? Yeah, but I, that's, I suppose it would be good to know which ones to target so that we can actively start targeting them as a process. You have three councillors in your ward, target yeah. all of them. Yeah. And then find out which ones are a waste of time. Can I just make a brief comment? She's a councillor. Yes, I am a councillor. And am I the only person in here from Salford? You see, because I, you won't think about this, but I, you know, I think Greater Manchester don't think about Salford and Manchester, because we do. Where in Manchester, people tend to think about Manchester, not Greater Manchester. Always think of Greater Manchester, because there are different councils with different approaches. Salford is it's like mega left wing. You know where there's like this small group of seven or eight in Manchester? They're lefties. I was really surprised because I only found out this recently. Salford, it's nearly all proper lefties. You go over to Trafford, it's nearly all proper lefties. No, it's not. Manchester, it very much surprises me because, you know, this is the cosmopolitan centre. But there are not enough lefties. <laughs> and the lefties are the ones who are passionate about the environment. Go to Salford, we have a lead member, Derek Antrobus, who leads on a planning and environment. Biggest lefty you can find. He teaches about the environment on open universities, is a big activist on environmental issues, always has been for years. You know, so maybe, yes, protest your local councillors, but also think about finding out what's going on in different areas and see if you can get things happening in other places as well. But, fun fact, Greater Manchester does not have a petition scheme. 
So this petition that we're doing wouldn't be possible against them yet. As, a, as an aside, most councillors do have surgeries. And as we can all see from the folks who turned up tonight, it's a much more powerful thing to turn up and look someone in the eye and say, this matters to me, than it is to tweet them or email them or even write them a paper letter. Um, so we, we are going to be putting up some suggestions as to the most effective ways of lobbying councillors and MPs, um, but we will also be looking for, for assistance on uh, how best to do that from those who have experience. So um, we've, we've completed all our speakers, so we're, we were into a, sort of an open Q&A, so any of you had questions that weren't answered earlier, um, feel free to bring them up now. Right. Yeah. So I have the t-shirt. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask the, the Natalie about um, what you think about uh, <coughs> pensions, divestment of fossil fuels in its effect uh, by both your members and its effect on the industries. So the question, sorry, to yeah. just to make sure everyone's... Yeah, to be honest with you, I would not know enough about it to comment on it. Yes, I know a little bit about it, but I'm far from being any sort of expert, so if you don't mind, I won't uh, embarrass myself by trying to answer it. The question, just for those who didn't hear, was about what people's opinions was of um, pensions divestment from fossil fuels. There's a person sat next to you who knows a thing or two. We worked out. Okay. Ali, do you want to say something about pension, about the 19th of July meeting? Is that useful? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, uh, I'm part of a group, uh, many groups, but part of a group called Fossil Free Greater Manchester, which is uh, campaigning to persuade the Greater Manchester Pension Fund to divest from fossil fuels. Right now, this pension fund has the uh, savings of uh, pension savings of lots of workers around Greater Manchester, lots of local authority workers, but other workers too. Uh, it currently has over two billion pounds invested in coal, oil, and gas companies, which is frankly outrageous. That money could be better spent on so that some of the other things, the solutions to climate change, rather than driving climate change. <clears throat> so the end of the campaign is to get them to take money out of fossil fuels, put it into the alternatives to the solutions to climate change. Um, on the 19th of July, it's the AGM, the pension fund, and we're organising a big demonstration outside that AGM. Um, so if you'd like to find out more, come talk to myself or Stuart, um, and we'll be able to tell you a bit more about that and how you can get involved. Thank you. Can we have a roving mic volunteer? <laughs> Thank you. report back. Um, I'm in Unite the Community um, and we organised a home event about a fortnight ago. This changes everything, Naomi Klein. Mm. Um, and I don't think we should counterpose. Like, I think I agree that it is about a process of change of ideas and behaviour leading into that. But one of the overwhelming things that people told us that came to, on our feedback sh sheets from this home event was that they basically um, do want to be put in touch with other people that want to um, you know, know what's going on, get more information about climate change. Um, they do want to network. You know, Some people were quite frustrated because I couldn't give them exact details on how they could get in touch with various organisations. So I think we do need to organise that. And some of the other things that people suggested that we should do um, from the feedback sheets um, were uh, more film events, more you know, people getting to know things, improving networking, um, local action, protest on the environment. Um, there's a big list of groups here that um, Mark shared with us. Um, and I, I think it's about anyone that's representing an organisation here, or sorry, not representing one, but is in one, um, you, you know, needs to keep in touch with their organisation and share things through that. Um, <coughs> There were, you know, lots of organisations that came to the film event, um, very wide ranging, and um, you know we do need a more inclusive 
um, movement in Manchester. You know, we, it needs to include people of colour. Um, you know, you, you know, of course, the young people are there already, but people with disabilities, all, all so sorts of Mancunians and greater Mancunians need to be included in it. Um, uh, and, and definitely people mentioned that they'd enjoy a, a forum event, we've got one today, but more of the same thing and, you know, conferences to share things. I also want to just mention that as well as what the guy over here said, uh, UCU the, uh, are hosting a joint union, they're hoping to host a joint union conference at the university on the 2nd of July. Um, so that's yeah, another place where people are going to be getting together to organise things. And I think it's going to keep on growing and growing, hopefully. Thank you very much. Um, my question is for Claire and for anyone else in the panel who wants to answer it as well. And it's it, towards uh, citizens' assemblies. And I really like the idea of citizens' assemblies and getting people involved in the political process um, more than just voting every every three years or every other week, as it seems to be at the moment. Um, how do we know that holding a citizens' assembly will create the outcomes which we want and that people in this room want, when we know for a fact that a lot of people in Manchester <coughs> don't share our views and don't have? Um, and it comes back to that question of being inclusive and. and if we're not an inclusive bunch, I suppose that's got to go off on a side tangent. But yeah, that's my basic question is how are we sure that if we have a citizen assembly, 100 people in here, would 51 of them say, let's go for climate, let's, let's yeah. tackle climate change? How do we make sure they come up with the right answer? Um, <laughs> so, well, we can't, but we have got examples of the past to, to show us that when we uh, give people this um, responsibility, they do act. Um, in, in, in the right way. Um, the best example recently is in Ireland. So in Ireland in 2016, the Citizens' Assembly was convened to answer five big questions. One of those was um, about the legality of abortion, and the Citizens' Assembly met and considered that one first. Um, reading up about that was really interesting that uh, the Assembly made their recommendations that indeed, yes, it should be legalised, and they asked Parliament to draw up, or draw up draft legislation, which Parliament did, um, but decided it needed to go to a referendum. Privately, the politicians, when they saw those recommendations, were horrified. They did not think Middle Ireland were ready for abortion to be legalised. And then, of course, when it went to referendum, 66% of the people approved it. It's less known that the other, one of the other five questions was on climate change. Uh, and. Um, the, that assembly came up with 13 bold recommendations, which included um, many of the things that I think people in this room would ask for, you know, massive um, forest planting, a uh, complete shift to renewable energies, um, spending twice as much on public transport, walking and cycling as we do on roads, which would be completely overturning our transport policy. So um, I, take, I took great encouragement from that. So basically, your, the, the answer to your question is because evidence shows that if you put that question to people, they come up with far bolder answers than politicians give them credit for. Um, and there was a quote I read from a woman who was on that assembly, which is, you know, she basically said, um, the politicians in, in Ireland didn't think um, that Ireland was ready for this, and it makes you wonder whether they know what their constituents feel. And that's the point, they don't, politicians don't. There was a survey done at Lancaster University that asked a number of MPs about climate change, and a load of them said they thought it was really, really, really important, and they all said that they didn't think the public had any appetite for change on it, and we know that's not true. So I think the answer is basically there's evidence to show, um, but yeah, it has to be a leap of faith as well. Um, yeah, look, I think it becomes another event rather than a process and my day, my fear that it is that a citizens assembly even if it did come out with all the right policies those policies then have to be uh, enacted there have to be implementation plans there have to be quarterly reports and the experience of the last 10 years in manchester shows us that even relatively radical policies that have 
relatively broad buy-in in the early days, run into the sand. And when the public scrutiny isn't there, then all sorts of excuses are found to sustain the status quo. And some of, some of the excuses are entirely valid. So Eva's point about the massive funding needed from central government. But sometimes a local authority does have um, the capacity to act and it chooses not to. And I, I fear that a citizens' assembly will be this another big moment where people think, great, I've done my part, now it's over to the bureaucrats. And I've got some bad news for you. The bureaucrats are generally, and I'm, I'm not going on a whole Eurosceptic thing here, but bureaucracies are small c conservative, and what we are talking about is a massive transformation. And that transformation is going to require week in, week out, month in, month out, scrutiny, lobbying, Freedom of Information Act requests, letters to newspapers, etc. And that, to me, is where we will win. We will not win in a citizens' assembly, even if it give, comes out with the right answers. Sorry if that's depressing. I just go, go for both of them, I suppose. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I don't, I don't think. No, there is no. There's no silver bullet like the silver buckshot. <laughs> I just think, don't, I, I just wanted to respond to that really. Don't you think though that it's about the creativity of the solutions? Isn't it exactly facing that history? But, but we, had, we had really creative solutions 10 years ago with the um, Magic for Certain Future. Creativity is not the problem, it's making this stuff get through into policy and become normalised. So I'm conscious there's plenty of folks at the back who are possibly nodding off or <laughs> we're not heard from them yet. Any, anyone at the back want to, or anyone else who's not asked the question yet, want to, want to raise any points? Uh, <clears throat> the question for Extinction Rebellion. This is an international problem of uh, climate emergency and one of the critical places in the world, and there aren't many of them, where we can have an influence is London. So I would ask how much of our energy should be directed towards London and how much towards Manchester? I think the reason why um, April's protests were carried out in London was because that's the seat of government and um, I'm obviously not involved in kind of deciding the strategy of uh, how those protests were carried out, but I think we saw that that tactic worked in the, that uh, the media coverage has completely changed. Um, media coverage of climate change has changed. But the coverage of those protests um, was definitely, uh, I don't know what people thought, I thought it was different to what I expected. I expected um, you know, protesters to be kind of vilified in press, and they weren't. It was quite a neutral coverage in that sense. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, to go back to the previous answer, I think it's both. I think it was in London, and I think what we have to show now is that the link between the two, from what Extinction Rebellion um, uh, has started, and the link to communities, because I think it's in communities uh, where we know we've got to come up with solutions for our problems here. Uh, and that's why I was keen to kind of start making that, start that conversation tonight. It's like, what does it mean to protest in Greater Manchester? And to Kate's point earlier, I think it is about the Greater Manchester level. We do have a mayor of Greater Manchester. He doesn't have a lot of power, but he does have a lot of symbolism. And I think a lot of some of the things that we talked about tonight should be aimed at him. He should convene a citizens' assembly at a Greater Manchester level. And the point of doing it is not necessarily um, around you know the, the, the nitty gritty of putting those policies into action the citizens assembly comes up with the bold decisions that shows the politicians that there is the will in the public which at the moment they have not believed so it's an act of it's an act of showing uh, politicians 
what the public will tolerate, which at the moment they think is over here. And as we've just demonstrated, it's actually over here. Um, so yeah, it's London and Manchester and any other communities around the country um, that can, can show action in the face of um, this crisis. Um, just in regards to the youth strike stance on that as well, is the fact that sometimes we do think that oh, maybe we should focus all our energy on one place. But what we want to show is this kind of united front in the sense that it's an all-round change that everybody wants to see. Because if just one person does it, it isn't going to make much enough of a difference for it to do it within the 12 to 15 year limit that we have. So even though obviously it has a more drastic impact in one place, we want to be able to show that this isn't just a thing that's centred in London. It's a thing that's centred in lower class, middle class, higher class places, conservative and labour. It needs to be this kind of all-round generation cultural thing in order for politicians to see just how much people want it and then obviously to reflect that in the laws they set. Um, sorry, I've got this question as well. Um, I've got a question given about, um, should there be a government minister for future generations? Um, so I'm a member, I'm the youth MP for Berry, which is the, Berry, the youth cabinet of um, Greater Manchester, of Greater Manchester, of the UK, is um, a collection of young people from every constituency, Northern Ireland, um, Scotland and the UK. And we all join together once a year and we basically think of things that we would like to see politicians do to reflect what our wants. And one thing that we tend to focus on is the fact that politicians make decisions on our behalf. And while you think you know what we want, what they think we want, and what we actually want are normally two very, very different things. And definitely getting someone in politics who could speak first-hand for young people is, stuff that we, is something that we're greatly pushing for. We've been campaigning for votes at 16 for about six years now which we know under a Conservative government probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. We're still going to continue to push for it. But um, definitely getting that younger representation is so important and getting younger people involved in politics at a younger age, because I know a lot of people in my school, they don't even know what left and right means. And it's, it's scary in that sense. They're going to be able to vote in a few years. And I think not using your opportunity and not knowing why you should vote makes people less inclined to. And then you don't get that even kind of democratic representation, which you need for the politicians to make an even decision. So definitely having that representation in government of all generations is part of democracy and I think the fact that you are missing a whole generation and they're the ones that the, the majority of the decisions you're making are going to affect. So definitely that is something I'd like to see in the future implemented. We have time for one more question uh, and then we'll uh, just let people uh, Mingle, as we want, as people want to continue with the Q and A, in which case we can, we have time, but we have to be out of here by nine. So, just just a quick question for Emma: um, Is there any support you'd like tomorrow from us who are not the young people? Um, the the youth strike isn't just for young people; it's for everyone. We've had people messaging us.